a reading from Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Welcome to Mission. Uh, What was just read to you is from the book of Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And the reason that was read to you like that is because we're in a series called Galatians, and God has been teaching us a whole bunch of things about what the gospel is all about, about what this life in Christ and following Jesus is all about. So if you have a Bible and you're opened up there to Galatians chapter 4, I'm just going to reread that to make sure that you caught what was just read. Some of you heard that and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool, you know, no big deal. Um, I actually believe that by the time you leave today, you will never see this, uh, this passage the same again. Like, just those few verses are meant to absolutely transform our understanding of who God is and who he says that you are. All right, so if you're there, all right, I'm just going to read it one more time because I don't think that you caught it. Uh, Galatians 4, verse 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. All right, that's an amazing, amazing statement. That is incredible news. That we would receive the full rights of son. Verse 6, because you are sons. Not you might be or hopefully you could be one day if you work hard enough and you behave just right. No, 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 that's not what it says. You are sons. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. No, you're a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. Does anyone get excited by that? I, maybe I'm the only person, but I've been living in it. All right, no, you had your chance, you missed it. I've been living in it all week. And God has just been just like pulling my chest apart, metaphorically, and, and helping me understand that, man, I get to refer to him, not as just some being out there. Man, I get to refer to him as Abba, Father. Abba, Father. This past week, My wife, Kelly, she looked at me, and and she said what every man dreams their wife will say to them. She looked at me, and she said, honey, let's go to Home Depot. And it was was amazing. I mean, it was a moment with God. I mean, tears were were falling, and my heart was expanding. And I said, yes, honey. I mean, whatever you wish. I mean, I will serve you by going to Home Depot. So so we, we loaded up the family. In, in the old minivan, and, and we, we head over to, to Home Depot. It's just, I mean, kingdom of God on earth, right? I mean, Home Depot is great, and you can just, you can just stay there forever. And, and so we get there, and uh, right when we walk in, I decide that I'll drive. So I, I get the shopping cart, and I've got two little girls. Some of you have met them before. One's a, a year and a half. The other one's three and a half. And so I put the year and a half year old um, in that contraption. I don't even know what they call it, but the, the holster deal. Holster, that's what guys call it. Put her in the holster. And, and, and then I grab the three-and-a-half-year-old, and I throw her in the basket, all right? So, so I'm, I'm driving. And, and we go up and down the aisles, and we went there for a specific purpose. So finally we got to kind of our section that, that we needed to check out. And, and so we're looking at stuff, and, and, and Kelly says, um, man, I just have some questions about this. I need to find, you know, one of those guys in the orange vest, because obviously I don't know the answer to any of that. So she tracks down, so she kind of leaves. And before she leaves, she's like, you're in charge. I'm like, absolutely, I'm in charge. I'm, I'm, quali- I'm overqualified to be in charge of these two little ones. So uh, there I am. I've got the little one. And I, I just kind of decide to unholster her. So I, I take her out of the holster. Now, my little one, she's kind of like Sonic the Hedgehog. I don't know if you guys have ever played that video game. That's dating me. But, like, her legs are always moving. It's unbelievable. Like, the second you set her down, wow, she's gone. Like, it's unbelievable, all right? Uh, so I take her out. Uh, and, and, and the second I set her down, she's gone. And then I take Hannah out. And I'm like, Hannah, um, this is Parenting 101, by the way, if you don't have kids. Hannah, you're in charge of the cart and mom's purse, all right? Just stay right here. Don't go anywhere, all right? I mean, I was very direct, very clear, and that's apparently good parenting. I was very direct and very clear. Uh, don't move and protect this purse. I got to go 
chase down your crazy younger sister. So, so I take off, and I'm, I can still run a little bit. I mean, I'm not as fast as I used to be, but, but I, it needed all of me. I mean, I, I take a quick left. I kind of leaned into the turn, and, and I'm just like chasing down Hallie, and she is fast. I'm telling you, she could outrun probably any year-and-a-half-year-old in the state. She is flying. I mean, I mean, and so finally, like, I almost have to dive after her, and I grab her, and, and I th- just throw her over my shoulder like this. All right, I'm like exhausted. I'm breathing heavy, and, and, and I carry her back. Um, to where Hannah was. Yeah. Parents, this is just a moment of truth. This is a safe place. How many of you have misplaced your kids before? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I'm just going to call it misplacing. So, so she had clear orders, but she, she did not follow those. Okay. And so all of a sudden, I come back, and I've got Hallie right here, but Hannah is nowhere to be found. No big deal. I'm sure she's just around the, the corner looking at sinks. So, so we, you know, um, and, and so I go around the corner expecting to see her, and she's not there. No big deal. I'm sure she's around the next corner. I go around the next corner. She's not there. And, and then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to panic. I walk down one aisle. I'm sure she's going to be there. She's not there. Okay, now if you've misplaced a child, it, it seems like eternity. This only took place over three minutes. It felt like three years. But I went from like, okay, we're going to be okay, concerned, stay calm, to like complete panic. I, I just began to panic. I began to freak out. I began to think about like horrible thoughts, like someone has my daughter and now I'm going to have to take them out and I'm going to go to jail for the rest of my life. Like I have all these horrible thoughts, and, and, but maybe someone you know, is holding her or maybe she just doesn't know where she is. So I'm freaking out. I'm running up an aisle or run down another aisle. I cannot find her. So then I just begin to just call out to her, Hannah, Hannah, Hannah. Like, I'm just, like, yelling out to her, and guys, like, pass me, totally judging me. They know what has happened. Hannah, where are you at? Hannah! And, 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 then, and then, like, five aisles over, I hear this little voice. Daddy, Daddy, I'm over here. And, and I spend a lot of time with my girls. I know her voice. My ear is acutely tuned to that little voice. And I knew, okay, she's okay. She's, she's just around the corner, so I kind of sprint down five more aisles, and I turn the corner, and there she is, like with a death grip on the, uh, the, the cart. She's terrified. She's frozen in fear. And, and I bend down, and I say, Hannah, it's okay. Your daddy's here. It's, it's okay. We're not going to tell mom. Your daddy, <laughs> your daddy is here. And, and, you know, we're really close. And she calls me daddy, and she throws her arms around me, and she just begins to kiss me, and she's like, daddy, I'm so glad that you're here. And I'm like, you have no idea how glad I am that you're here. And, you know, I've just been thinking about that story all week. You know, these words that I just read, perhaps they didn't explode in your heart, but maybe that's because you don't know what Abba Father means. Only three times in the New Testament do we see this phrase, Abba Father, over in Romans chapter 8. Read that. Paul, again, very similar, says it, Abba Father. Father, this this spirit of adoption, Jesus, in Mark 14, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he cries out to his father, and he calls him in this Aramaic term, one of the most intimate Aramaic phrases that there was, he calls out to his father, Abba, Father. You see, Paul, what he is trying to communicate to the Galatian church is first what the gospel is, what it means to be justified. And that's what we've been talking about the last two weeks. And as we begin to understand what it means to be justified, I'm telling you, your mind begins to be transformed. It really does. But quickly, Paul turns a corner in chapter 4, and all of a sudden, our heart begins to melt. Paul is saying, maybe you've forgotten, but you are no longer under the law. And read the end of chapter 3, and what that is, is the law is like this slave master looking over the shoulder of those that are still under the law. And Paul then gives this competing metaphor that's so much better to say, in essence, what would you like? Do you still want that, or do you want an Abba Father? A God of the universe that you can refer to and relate to as Father, as Dad, as someone that isn't distant, but someone that is right here, right now next to you, a father that came searching for you, a father that heard your voice, a father that didn't call out to you in just a general term, a father that called out to you by name, Abba, Father. It was about three years ago that I had this opportunity to to lead one of my buddies to to faith, And, and what that means is 
In essence, um, I try to explain it kind of simple to people. I said, this is going to cost you everything, all right? But at the same time, you're going to get everything, all right? If you want heaven to start right now and then your life to be a comma when you die and for it to go on to eternity, what you need to do is you need to hand the keys of your life to Jesus. And you need to say, Jesus, you weren't just a good teacher, but you are Savior, you're King, you're Lord. And so I'm, I'm, I'm having this conversation with one of my buddies. We're out on the back patio, and he'd been in rehab for a really long time. He actually started uh, drinking at age 11 and just got swept away, major, major addiction. He was at age 23, and he had just gotten out of the hospital for a long time. And they're like, you don't have long to live. Like, if you don't stop, you're going to die. And someone connected me with him. I first met him at Starbucks, where I meet most people for the first time. And we just began to hang out to the point where we were together one night in, in our little apartment. And we were outside, and he was having a smoke, and we are just talking. And it got to the point where he looked at me and he's like, John, he's like, I'm tired of hearing about this Abba Father. I'm tired of hearing about this, this God that is, is for me. And I hear it from you, but it's not real in my life. He said, I want that. I need that. You know, I can just admit right here, this is what he did on the patio, that I need a Savior. And so I'm like freaking out on the inside, so excited. So I'm like, all right, here's what we do. Let's pray together. We prayed together right there, and his life was transformed. He said yes to Jesus Christ. In that moment, he became a son. You see, we first start by, by referring to God as Abba Father, and when we begin to refer to him as Abba Father, we begin to understand that we are an heir. We're not a number. You're not a number. You're an heir. You may think that God doesn't see you, but he sees you. If you're in Jesus Christ today, you may have come in here today carrying the weight of the world on your back. But listen, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're not just a number. You're a daughter of the Most High King. You're a son of the Most High God. If you came in here today as a Christian, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to understand what it says in 1 John 3, 1. How great the love of the Father. That he, has, he has lavished it on us. And he, it talks about in 1 John 3, 1, that we are sons and daughters of God. Not we might be, or hopefully we could be. No, but the gospel, the cross is enough. And listen, son of God, right now, I see a whole bunch of sons right here in front of me. Man, you need to know you're enough. Man, he looks at you right now. If you're in Christ and he doesn't say, man, you just need to work harder. You need to behave a little bit better. You need to just try a little bit harder. He looks at you and he says, you are enough. You're an heir. Daughter of God, he looks at you and he says, you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. What does that mean? It means that God didn't outsource the making of you. He said, no, I'm going to do that myself. Daughter of God, he looks at you right now and he says, you are, you're a knockout. Unbelievable. I mean, he looks at you and he just kind of gathers heaven around saying, man, look at her. I did that. I did that. You're an heir. You're an heir to the throne. Well, this buddy of mine, he said yes to Jesus. And I, I said, well, um, this is the starting line, not the finish line. And I said, there's a kind of a church term that people throw around a lot called uh, discipleship. And no one really knows what it means. But I said, here's what it really means. It just means that we're going to hang out for a specific period of time. And I'm going to follow Jesus with crazy passion. And I'm going to teach you how to do the exact same thing. So when I open the Bible, you're going to open your Bible, and we're just going to talk about it. I'm going to teach you how to open God's Word. I'm going to talk to you about some different spiritual disciplines. I'm going to teach you how to share your faith. And I said, do you want that? He's like, yes. I'm like, good, because that's like what it means then to follow Jesus. So I said, all right, it's all going to start on Saturday at 9 a.m. That, that's the kickoff, all right? You've said yes to Jesus. Now we're about to get our following of Jesus on starting at, at 9 a.m. on Saturday. And he's like, I'm in. And I said, all right, I'm going to cook breakfast. All right, and if you know me at all, you know I love to cook, uh, and I'm pretty good at cooking, but I'm way better at eating, all right? So, like, it's a spiritual gift. I have the spiritual gift of eating, and some of you do as well. And so I was thinking about, all right, what can I do to make this, this breakfast epic? It's like, the, the, like the guy's just going to, he's going to fall over. He's not going to believe it when he walks in. I love creating experiences. So I'm like, this will not just be any breakfast. This will be the breakfast of his life. And so I, I waited on God. And what I mean by that is I just said, God, will you just give me something to think about here? Spirit of God, speak to me. And he did, quickly. And the word was bacon. And, and so it was, it was quick. And, and I was like, I've heard from God. So, I mean, it was like a pound and a half of, of, of bacon. I, mean, I was just trying to be obedient to God. And, and, and then, then after that, it was thinking of, 
All right, I'm going to do some eggs, but like with the sausage kind of eggs in it. Yeah, anyone, anyone uh, a witness to that? Okay, you can like talk to me at this moment. It's okay. Um, and, then, and then I did um, some like really, the really expensive orange juice, like, like four and a half bucks. You're like, man, this is going to kill me, but it's worth it. You know, it's like fresh squeeze. Anyone? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and, and, and I love coffee. Um, so I'm like, but I, I'm not just going to pick up coffee. No, no, no. I'm going to get the beans, and, I, and, yeah, and I'm going to grind them. Witness? Anybody? No? And, and, and then I'm not just going to brew it. No, no. I'm French pressing this thing. Any French pressers in the house? All right, you're my people. I mean, like, go to the next level. Don't just do it halfway. And, and, and so I'm planning this whole thing out. And I get some healthy toast to try to make up for everything else. So, so, so I'm planning this thing out. And I'm telling Kelly how excited I am. And she knows how I'm wired up. I just love stuff like this. So he's supposed to be there at 9. And so I get up early. You know, like early. And like 8. And, and so I plan everything out. I have everything ready. Like the, the eggs turned out perfect. You know, the, the house was filled with, I think, maybe the aroma of heaven, bacon, just all over the house. It was an incredible smell. The coffee was just perfect and ready to go, get pressed. The toast was done. I had it all ready. Um, and it was about like 10 till. And so I'm like, man, I, you know, I did pretty good on time management here, which typically doesn't happen. Uh, I'm like, I'm just going to go ahead and get the table um, set up. All right, like I set the table. And now guys, don't even, all right, you're, try, you're trying, gonna try to take my man card on this, like who sets the table for when they hang out with a buddy? That's, okay, I went to the next level and I had some time on my hands. So I get the plates out, the nice plates, you know, you know what the nice plates are, like the real silverware, like I get it all out and I get the table set, napkins, like which are paper towels, you know, uh, I, I get those all out. I get all the food on the table and it turns nine o'clock and I'm like, I'm ready going to share Jesus and help this guy understand how to follow Jesus. We're going to open God's word together. I'm going to talk to him about this. I'm just fired up. And 902 happens. And then 905 and then at about 910 I realize that he must be stuck in traffic. It's Saturday morning of course. And, and, and then at about 920 um, I realize man this, this guy is like a, a, an amazing, like he's off to an incredible start. He's praying. He's somewhere praying before we even meet. That's what I'm thinking. And then about 945 hits I'm like I'm not sure what's going on. At about 9.55, I'm standing there. I'm looking at this table that is all set up. I can smell the food, and I'm excited to meet with this guy, but I realize at 9.55 that I've been stood up. You ever been stood up before? All right, so I'm just standing there, and I'm looking at all this, and I am mad. I'm, like, like mad. Like, I can't believe this guy. Like, I'm, I'm not praying with him. I'm like, we're going to fight. Like, I'm going to wrestle <laughs> this guy. Seriously. I just wasted $100 on, like, the most epic breakfast. Um, and I'm standing there, and I'm looking at this table. It's all set up. And I'm so mad. I'm talking to God about this, you know, kind of thing. And, um, but then God helped me see something I've never seen before. That son, because I am. I'm an heir. Son, see that table? Every single morning, I'm up before you. Every single morning, I go the extra mile. Every single morning, I put out a chair with your name on it. Every single morning, because I am your Abba Father and you are my son, I am sitting there waiting to meet with you. He said, you see it? And I'm standing there and I'm looking at the table and, and I'm no longer angry. Now I'm filled with an understanding that he is my father. And the God of the universe, who is all-powerful, is also all-intimate. I mean, I'm looking at this table, and in, in an instant, my paradigm has shifted. Man, I get to meet with the Most High God. I get to spend time with Him. We can sit at the table, and He can open my eyes to see His truth like never before. He can talk to me about what it looks like to follow Him. Like, we can commune together around the table. You see, the book of Galatians, it, it's not written to those that are investigating the faith. It's not. It's not written to those that are seekers, those that aren't sure yet who Jesus is. It's not written to them. That's not the audience. And we've been learning that as we've been doing our, our daily video devotionals. No, who's it written to? It's written to the already convinced in southern Galatia. And when I talk about Abba Father... And when I talk about that you're an heir, it is so easy for those of us that have been following Jesus for some time to say, man, I really hope the person next to me gets this. But this was to the already convinced. 
And my belief is that like, when we gather like this, it is this opportunity for us to say, God, would you speak to me in a fresh way? Would you help me understand who you are in a new way? God, would you help me understand that you are Abba Father and because of that, I'm now an heir. You see what happens so often. In the last, I don't know, eight, nine years, we've spent our time working with college students and those in their 20s. And I could tell you, person after person, coffee after coffee with these students, and I talk to them about what I'm talking to you about. And they'll just say, man, it sounds great, but you need to understand this love of a father thing, it just doesn't register. You don't know my earthly dad. And for whatever reason, I can't see this heavenly father because I just look through the lens of my earthly father. And some of you, that's true. Let me tell you, your earthly father, he was absent. But your heavenly father, he's Abba. Man, I mean, your earthly father, he was controlling. He used his power in all the wrong ways. But your heavenly father, he is kind. I mean, some of you, you would stand up right now and you say, yeah, my earthly father, I mean, he was, he was someone that would intimidate me. He would try to control me. He was someone that was totally uninterested and uninvolved. You would say, my earthly father, he never spoke to who my true self is. He never said a word of what my true identity is. But let me just tell you what Paul is saying. That you have a father that you can cry out to. That calls you by name. That says, you are my son. That you are my daughter. I mean, what? What does that look like for you today? Just say, God, just heal me and move away some of these misconceptions that I still see you through. This lens that is broken that I see you through. God, help me see. God, reorient my life to your word, to your gospel, and what you're saying here in Galatians. And some of you, right, you're here today because someone invited or Maybe you, you saw us online. I'm not sure how you heard about Mission Church, but you're here today. Maybe this is your first church experience ever. The good news is this is also for you. You weren't the intended audience originally in the context, but this is for you. It was about uh, a week and a half ago. I referred to this a little bit last week. One of the most exciting things easily of this entire year happened. I was with all of our high school and junior high students on Wednesday nights. It's a blast. We have a lot of fun. And near the end of the night, one of our high school students said, John, can we talk? And so there I was out front talking to this high school student that, that attends Lake Park. And I'm talking to her about everything that I've been talking to you about. And some of you, you are exactly in the same shoes that she was in. You're seeking. You're investigating. You have yet to say yes to Jesus Christ. And I looked at her and I said, listen. I said, you can pull out of here tonight in your mom's car as someone that is lost, you really can. I mean, you can leave here tonight as someone that is lost, or you can leave here tonight as a daughter of God. And as I'm talking to her, the Spirit of God shows up on the scene. And as I'm talking to her, she just begins to cry, and she's just as overwhelmed and amazed that she could leave that night as a daughter of God. And some of you, you need to know right now, may you hear from God, may the lights come on in this moment that you can pull out of this parking lot today as a son of God, as a daughter of God. I mean, you can hear from your perfect father, your heavenly father, that he's been seeing you, he's been watching you, he's been chasing you up and down every single aisle since the very beginning. And he's calling you by name right now. And he's moving towards you. Will you respond? Dad, here I am. I'm over here. Man, will you reach out your hand and take the hand of the one that made you the hands that were pierced for your sins and for mine. Will you take his hand? Abba, Father. I'm not sure what it does to you. I know what it does to me. I, can't, I just can't believe it. Someone like me. That I get to refer to the God that made everything as my father. I just can't get over that. Someone like me. That's done the things that I've done. That I could be called an heir that I can be seated with Christ, someone like me, Abba Father, an heir to the throne. And we're going to take communion. And as a church, um, we say that we're like radically inclusive. And here's what we mean by that. Um, I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did last week. This church is for you. 
That's what inclusive means. I don't care if you've never been to church ever, that this church is for you. Inclusive, what we mean by that is this, is that you don't have to get cleaned up before you can be part of this church. You come as you are. You come as you are. And we're going to accept you as you are, but we're going to challenge you like crazy to not stay the way that you are. We're inclusive. But the only thing that we do, really, that's exclusive is communion. And here's why it's exclusive. Is I know this kind of part can be very traditional. Maybe you've taken communion a hundred times, and it can, you can just grow numb to it, and you don't even know what it means anymore, and I've been there before. But what communion is, it's not just taking bread and dipping it in you know, juice. It, that's not just what it is. It's a statement. It's the boldest statement you can actually ever make. It's a statement by saying, listen, everything that Paul is saying in Galatians is true. It's a statement when you approach the communion table that, man, even someone like me could be declared by the verdict of God that I am justified. I'm innocent. I'm set free. I'm not guilty. That's what communion is. And we approach the communion table and we look at the bread and that represents the body of Jesus Christ himself. That's what it represents. And we are reminded of him who went to the cross in our place. We're reminded that he took our place. See, it's a statement. It's a statement of saying Jesus wasn't just a good teacher, but Jesus is king. He's Lord. He's Savior. He's sovereign. He's over everything. He's got the keys to my life. We take that bread and we dip it into the blood. We acknowledge that this wasn't a pretty scene on Calvary. Jesus was sacrificed. And blood came from his head. And blood spilled out around the ground because it had to. Man, I don't know what communion does to you, but I know for me it's that just reminder of what I've been rescued from and what I've been rescued for. Communion, the most exclusive thing that we do. I'm going to ask our band if they would come up. They're going to play some music. Laura's going to sing as we take communion. And some of you right now, you're followers of Jesus. I mean, you've come to that place where you've made him king. This is for you. Approach the communion table just saying, in a mysterious way, meet with me, God. Communion is eating with God. Communion is saying, man, there is a chair around the table with my name on it. The most costly of chairs. A chair that cost Jesus his life. Communion is pulling up a chair around the table of God and say, God, I am eating with you. I'm communing with you. Those of you that are followers of Jesus, this is what we get to do. Those of you that are investigating who Jesus is, this could be the first time in your life that you could take communion and really align with what it means. I mean, you can say yes to Jesus today through communion. And as you leave today, you can pull out of this place as a son of God, as a daughter of the Most High King. Why not today? Why not today? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a better love story? There ain't going to be one. This is the most ridiculous, outrageous love story of all time. The story that Jesus came searching for you. What are you waiting for? Make today the day. Put a stake in the ground. Get up as others around you get up and approach the communion table and just say, Jesus, I need you. And I'm just admitting right now that I need you. I need you to forgive me. I acknowledge that you're Savior. I acknowledge that you're King. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Change me. Let me pray for our communion. And then uh, when you're ready, you can just get up and approach the communion table. It'll be back there and also uh, up here. Father, thank you that we can refer to you as Father. So God, I, I just ask, Holy Spirit, just, just sweep over this place right now. Because Some of us, we're just numb to that. It, didn't, it didn't, even, didn't even budge us. It didn't even affect anything. It's like we can't even remember what we were saved from. It's such a distant memory. And we just approach the communion table and we take it for granted. So Spirit of God, right now, I just ask that you would convict all of us. Ch challenge every single one of us. Lift our eyes to see beyond our circumstances and situations to see the cross, to see that you are in charge. God, remind us right now the most outrageous love story ever of a father sending his son to earth to live a perfect life, to die a gruesome death, to be raised to life so that we can be raised with him, seated with Christ, so that we can cry out to you, the spirit that is within us, we can cry out to you, Abba. 
that we can walk around knowing our identity is not up for grabs. No, we're sons. We're daughters of God. Praise Jesus for that truth. We thank you for that truth. We just say thank you in the best way that we can. Hallelujah for that truth. We are daughters and sons of the Most High God. And for some right now that are, they have yet to say yes to you, Jesus. You know who they are and they're in here. I know. Every weekend, people are saying yes to you. May this be their day, today, right now. May they get up, may you just pull them out of their chair and that they would approach the communion table and say yes to you. They could be forgiven forever in an instant. We love you, God. We worship you, God. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your love. We pray this, Jesus, in your name.